had moved enough to make it only a glancing blow, but it was enough to knock me off balance. I stumbled and fell to the floor while the man rushed toward me. He had a crazed look in his eyes as he raised the bat for another blow. I struggled to get the gun out of my pocket. In my panic, I just pointed it at him and pulled the trigger, firing through the fabric of the kangaroo pocket. At first, I wasn't sure I had hit him. He froze, bat over his head, eyes wide, but I wasn't sure if he froze because of shock or because he'd been shot. Then he seemed to come to his senses. He dropped one hand to his stomach and felt around. Then I saw the blood coming out of a wound near his hand. He cried out and whipped the bat down, but I rolled out of the way, getting to my knees and pulling the pistol out of my pocket. He stumbled into the back of the recliner and then whirled on me. I fired again, this time hitting him in the chest. I scrambled to my feet as he froze again. This time, he dropped the baseball bat and fell back, hitting the recliner and falling to the floor. The man twitched and groaned as blood soaked into the carpet under him. I stood and watched, my head buzzing sickly as a floating feeling came over me. I had the momentary impression that this was all a dream, but it wasn't. The sound of the two gunshots rang in my head and a wave of panic engulfed me. I ran to the back of the house, leaving the sliding glass door open as I dashed into the backyard. I left the gate open, only forcing myself to slow down and try to walk normally when I reached the street. Once I got to my truck, I pulled out of the neighborhood as fast as I could, nearly hitting another truck at the intersection. After I'd been driving for several minutes, I started to calm down and think rationally for the first time in what seemed like days. My head throbbed from where the man had hit me with the bat. I knew I was lucky. It hadn't been much more than a glancing blow. I would have a bruise though. Pushing the pain aside, I focused. I knew I had to get rid of the gun. That was step one. So I drove to Greenbrier Lake and chucked the weapon into the dark water before hustling back to my idling truck. When I got home, the house was quiet. I stripped my clothes off and started a load of laundry to wash the gunshot residue off. Then I got in the shower and scrubbed myself down. It was only when I was in the shower that I realized I hadn't been wearing gloves. My prints were on the sliding glass door and the gate. It wouldn't matter that he had killed those two girls. The law didn't make exceptions for killing killers. Murder was murder, so I needed to cover my tracks. When I was done in the shower, I was getting dressed in my dark bedroom, pulling on old clothes I hadn't worn in a long time. My wife woke up and mumbled. Where have you been? Nowhere, I said. Go back to sleep. I walked to my daughter's bedroom and saw that she was sleeping soundly. I went to the kitchen and grabbed some supplies from under the sink. Then I got an old black jacket from the back of the entryway closet, along with a baseball cap. With my supplies and a grocery bag, I left the house as quietly as I could, and I drove back to the scene of the crime. The streets of Greenbrier were quiet, and I was relieved to see that the same could be said for the cul-de-sac I'd been at just over an hour earlier. There were no police cars, no ambulances, just a quiet, small-town street, the houses dark, their inhabitants slumbering. I drove past the mouth of the cul-de-sac and parked on the side of the road, then I walked to the house, my bag of supplies in one hand, hat pulled down over my face. The fence gate was still open, as was the sliding glass door. Nothing had changed. The dead man was still in the living room where he'd fallen. I set my bag of supplies down on the kitchen counter and pulled out the nitrile gloves I'd brought, along with the all-purpose cleaner. Although I'd brought some cleaning rags, I decided to use the paper towels from the kitchen instead. Wiping down everything took a good half an hour. The gate, the door, and anything I could have touched in the living room. I also wiped down the baseball bat, hoping it would eliminate the DNA that had surely gotten on it when the guy hit me with it. I worked with a feverish intensity, a ball of nerves sitting heavily in my stomach. But I wasn't sorry for what I'd done. I felt certain that I'd done the world a favor by killing the man. Instead, I was scared of getting caught. I was afraid that police cars would come rolling up any minute 
and I would go to prison for years, even though the guy had killed two innocent girls. That fear of punishment kept me working, though, and thinking. I found a small vacuum in the hall closet, next to the box it had come in, and I vacuumed as much of the living room carpet as I could without sucking up any of the man's blood. When I was done, I emptied the vacuum into the kitchen trash. As I was just about to tie the trash bag up and leave with all my supplies, I thought about the two bullets inside the man. I'd gotten rid of the gun, but what if they found it? The gun was registered in my name. They could match the bullets to the gun, and the gun to me. I stepped back into the living room and looked down at the dead man, and I knew what I had to do. I grabbed the man's legs and pulled him away from the blood-soaked carpet. Then I got a knife from the kitchen and knelt beside the man. He smelled of blood, faint body odor, and urine. I unbuttoned his shirt and exposed the two gunshot wounds on his abdomen. Swallowing, I steeled myself for the task to come. I had to get those bullets out. Tentatively, I stuck the tip of the knife into one of the bullet holes and started digging around. When I was done, hours later, I was exhausted. Being a mechanic, I was used to working with my hands in small spaces. So when I started digging the bullets out, I thought it would be a relatively easy task. I was wrong. The one in his stomach only took me about 30 minutes to extract, but the one in his chest was a different story. I started first by going through his chest, but when it proved difficult, I decided to turn him over and try to go through his back. It was a stupid decision. From either side, there were ribs in the way. I ended up having to separate the ribs before digging around in his chest cavity to find the bullet. I also removed his heart while searching for the bullet. I let my anger get the better of me, and the heart was in the way. So I hacked it out and set it aside. Ten minutes later, I located the bullet. It took me another hour to clean the blood off my forearms in the kitchen sink. Once I was done doing that, I found a bottle of bleach and poured half of it down the sink, thinking it would make any of my DNA down there unusable. Then I splashed the other half of the bleach over the guy's body and on the floor where I'd been working. When I was ready to leave, I looked around to make sure I hadn't missed anything. That was when I saw the heart, sitting on the recliner where I tossed it after removing it. I thought briefly about putting it back inside, but that would mean getting bloody again. So I just left it where it was and left the house, once again wearing my dark jacket and my baseball cap. I got home in the early morning hours and looked in on Lily. She was still asleep. As I looked at her, I felt a swelling pride that I had done something to protect her. I had done what the police failed to do. I had made a difference. And although my wife and daughter would never know it was me, I would know. That was all that mattered. I took another shower, this time using the hall bathroom so my wife wouldn't wake up. When I was done, I went to the living room and stretched out on the couch. I was hoping I could just say I was having trouble sleeping again and went out to the living room. If I was lucky, my wife wouldn't know I'd been gone for most of the night. At least, not after the first time I came home. Not five minutes after I laid down, I was sound asleep. <gasps> Gasping awake, I looked at my hands, expecting to find them covered with blood. And for a moment, as the residual dream fog was forced away by reality asserting itself, they were. The man's blood was all over them, the man whose name I didn't even know. But as confusion fell away and my memories from the night before came into stark relief, I realized that my hands were clean, if only literally. You killed a man last night, a voice in my head said, and in the shrill woman's voice. Murderer! Yeah, but he deserved it, I answered. He murdered two teenage girls, and he did God knows what to them in the process. I heard the shower in the hall going. Lily getting ready for school. Bethany came in from the kitchen holding two cups of coffee. I smiled at her and she returned the gesture, if sadly. What happened to you last night? She asked. You missed dinner. I'm sorry, I said. 
suddenly searching for some excuse that couldn't be easily disputed. Not that she would check my alibi. She trusted me. I just had to blow off some steam. I've been so stressed over these murders. She handed me a cup of coffee and then sat down on the couch beside me. So what did you do to blow off your steam? The lie came to me easily after a moment. I went to Top Golf and hit some balls for a couple of hours, had a few beers. Wow, you drove all the way to Top Golf? I shrugged. It's only 45 minutes. The drive did me good. Bethany sighed. Well, I wish you would have called or texted. I was worried. I know, I said. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. I got it out of my system. Does that mean you're not worried about the murders anymore? I'm still worried, I told her. But I'm no longer obsessing. I paused. But that still doesn't mean I want Lily walking to and from school by herself. Not until the guy is caught. Bethany nodded like she expected that answer. I had to keep up the charade. I knew the guy wouldn't be caught because he was already dead. But once the police found out about the guy I'd killed, they would surely be able to tie him to the two murders. Maybe they already had his DNA and just needed to match it. Or maybe they would find trophies in his house. I wanted to go searching around for evidence after I'd killed him. More chances to leave my DNA around the house. But I was sure he was the guy. The fact that he'd been driving a silver Mazda and then suddenly wasn't. The way he'd tried to pick up that girl near the high school. He was around the right build. And he could have simply shaved off his beard after the first murder. It had to be him. So it was over now. The murderer was dead. The danger was over. But I had to pretend like I didn't know that. I had to play the helpless and concerned father that my wife and daughter thought I was. But I wasn't helpless. I knew that now. I'd taken action. I'd done some good in the world instead of just being in the world. It felt good. I drove my daughter to school that morning and then went to work. Marcus was mad at me for calling in sick the day before, but it didn't bother me. He would get over it. As I worked on my first tractor that morning, cleaning a carburetor, I recalled the sensation of digging around in the guy's body. It surprised me how easily I did it. It was like I was able to flip a switch and think of him not as a man, but as a machine, much like a tractor. I'd been able to turn off any empathy I felt for this other human being and just concentrate on the task at hand. I suppose it's true what they say about never knowing how you'll react in a situation until you're in that situation. While I'd been scared shitless when the guy came at me with the bat, I'd managed to get the better of him. And once I did, I managed to do what needed to be done to protect myself and my family. Because that's what it's all about. That was the most important thing, protecting my family keeping us together, which was why I'd gone back to clean up and pull the bullets out of him. Because if I ever got caught for what I'd done, it would throw my family into turmoil. I couldn't have that. I wouldn't allow that to happen. And now I had the confidence I needed to handle any situation that was thrown at me. So I smiled as I worked. For the first time in a long time, life was good. I've already been up here twice in the past two weeks, talking to you, bringing you bad news. State Police Superintendent Jeffers had his hands propped on either side of the podium. He leaned toward the microphones, his face pinkish in the lights from the TV cameras. And I'm afraid I have to do it again. I pray this is the last time. Superintendent Jeffers paused, his gray eyes seeming to look directly through the television and at me. I fought the urge to squirm on the couch next to my wife. Lily was in her room doing her homework after dinner. It was two days after I'd killed the murderer. I felt that he was about to announce the death of the man I'd killed, but his downtrodden attitude and his mention of bad news had my stomach churning. Wouldn't it be good news that the murderer had been killed? Sure, they would have to do a token investigation, but they wouldn't look too hard, would they? Surely not. Jeffers cleared his throat. A 15-year-old girl named Leslie Ushensky was found murdered in West Greenbrier last night. There was a murmur from the gathered crowd at the press conference. Next to me, Bethany raised a hand to her mouth and whispered, Oh my God, another one? I 
I swallowed hard. Last night? Maybe she'd been murdered before that and they only found her last night. I leaned toward the TV, waiting eagerly for more information. The details of this horrific murder are such that we believe it was committed by the same perpetrator who murdered Misha Brodowski and Andy Lorraine. Jeffers continued. In a moment, I'm going to show you a short video clip taken of the suspect outside the gas station where Misha Brodowski was killed. We believe this is the man responsible for all three murders. We believe he is local, or at least knows the area well, and we need your help in finding him. So as you watch the short video clip, I want you to pay attention to the way he walks and the way he holds himself. Unfortunately, the clip isn't of the best quality, but it's all we have right now. If you think you know who this is, call the anonymous tip line. We'll look into it. Please, if you have any inkling that it might be someone you know, let us know. If it's not them, they will be cleared. But if it is, then you'll have helped get a brutal killer off the streets of this town. Bethany reached out and grabbed my hand. I barely noticed. Now, Jeffers said, the last time anyone saw Leslie Ushensky was yesterday morning when she left for school. I shot up from the couch, suddenly feeling sick. Yesterday morning? It's not possible. I killed him. He couldn't have abducted her yesterday. He was dead. You killed an innocent man, a voice in my head said. You're a murderer, murderer. Carter? Bethany asked. Are you okay? No, I said, grabbing a handful of my hair. No, 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 no. The masticated chicken dinner came rushing up my throat. I ran to the kitchen and vomited in the sink, remembering the shocked look on the man's face after I shot him. Bethany hurried after me and rubbed my back as I finished emptying my stomach. Jesus, are you okay? What's wrong? I shook my head, spitting strings of bile out. I just can't bear the thought of Lily dying like that. It's too horrible. Bethany made comforting sounds, still rubbing my back. We're not going to let that happen. No way. What the hell did I do? I asked myself. Who did I kill? I found out the next day, Saturday, that the man I killed was George Reynolds. I was at the grocery store with Bethany and Lily doing our weekly shopping when I ran into Lev from work. Bethany had sent me off to grab a few items when I saw Lev in the cereal aisle. Did you hear? Lev asked before I even had a chance to say hello. I shook my head. Hear what? Lev slowed his cart as he approached. He narrowed his eyes and asked in his Russian accent. Are you okay? You look ill. I'm fine, I lied. The truth was, I hadn't slept again, and I couldn't seem to keep any food down. Hear what? I prompted. They found another body, Lev said. This time a man, George Reynolds. I do not know him, but I have seen him around. He works at the farmer's insurance place. Or worked, I should say. Elise knows his wife. Elise was Lev's wife. I knew her pretty well. I was speechless for a second, frozen in remembering what I'd done to the man. I was insides felt through the nitrile gloves covering my hands. I was blood stuck to my arm hairs as it dried. Oh no, Lev said in a hushed tone. Did you know him? Huh? No, I said. You just looked like I didn't know him, I said too forcefully. Okay, sorry. I shook my head. No, I'm sorry. This whole thing has been so stressful. I can't stop worrying about Lily. I just want to keep her home all the time now. I have nightmares about her getting killed. I cannot imagine, Lev said, shaking his head in commiseration. He didn't have any kids, not yet. He was young though, only in his mid-twenties. So what else did you hear about his death? I asked. I half expected Lev to point at me and say, I heard you killed him, you sick fuck. You're going to prison for the rest of your life. But of course he didn't. He said, the police think he was killed by the same guy who killed the girls but they don't know why he suddenly targeted a middle-aged man. It is crazy, man. No one is safe, no one. The heaviness I'd been carrying around lifted slightly. They think it's the same guy? That's good for me, I thought. Why do they think so? I asked him. My coworker shrugged. 
They're being secretive about it. Something about similarities at the murder scene. Elise suddenly appeared at the end of the aisle. What's taking so long? She asked. She was American and of Hispanic descent. No Russian accent. Did you get the granola? She saw me and waved. Oh, hey, Carter. How are you? I smiled thinly. Hey, Elise. How are you? I'm good. Just hungry. Let's get the stuff home and go eat, Lev. I managed to smile as Lev grabbed a bag of granola from a nearby shelf and threw it in his cart. See you at work, my friend, he said. After we were home and finished putting the groceries away, I ducked into the home office and got on my laptop. I did a search and found a recording of the press conference from that morning about the murder of George Reynolds. I had to breathe deeply for a minute to get myself under control before pressing play, but I managed to watch a good portion of the 20-minute video without too much discomfort. At least until Superintendent Jeffers got to the part about the last time anyone had seen George Reynolds alive. On Wednesday afternoon, April the 17th, George Reynolds stopped at Greenbrier High School to talk with his daughter. I can tell you that he and his wife were in the process of a divorce and, as is so often unavoidable, his daughter was caught in the middle of it. They'd had a fight, and he wanted to clear the air. Their interaction was short, and George Reynolds drove off soon after. That was the last time anyone saw him alive. He was murdered later that night. So if anyone was outside the school between 2.20 and 2.40 Wednesday afternoon, please let us know if you saw anything. Use the Crime Stoppers number at the bottom of your screen to give a completely anonymous tip. I sank into my chair, wondering if anyone saw me following Reynolds. Then I thought about the two tips I'd called in about George Reynolds. Can they trace the tips? I wondered. If they could, I was screwed. There was no way they wouldn't connect me to the murder. It wouldn't matter that I hadn't killed those three other girls. They would look at me eventually. I opened a browser tab and started to type a search into Google about whether Crime Stoppers tips were truly anonymous. But I stopped myself. Searching for that on my personal computer would only provide more evidence against me. I needed to be more careful. I needed to be smart. I couldn't let them take me to prison. Standing from my desk on shaky legs, I decided I needed to leave. If the police came here, to my home, I needed to be elsewhere. At least until I could figure out what the hell I could do about this problem. It was only a matter of time until they started looking at me. And that would mean fewer resources looking for the killer. I left my phone on my desk, took my keys and wallet, and left the house without a word to my wife or daughter. They couldn't know where I was going. As I drove down the street in the Saturday afternoon sunshine, something like a plan started to form in my mind. I drove out of Greenbrier to nearby Clarksville and bought a prepaid cell phone at a gas station using cash. Knowing I would need more cash than what I had, I drove another hour south and used an ATM to withdraw $1,000. I used some of the cash to purchase a box of nitrile gloves from a grocery store. Then I drove back north to Greenbrier. I knew it was only a matter of time before they figured out I was responsible for George Reynolds' death. If it wasn't someone who'd seen my truck at the high school, it would be George's neighbor who pulled up just as I was walking in the cul-de-sac. And if it wasn't that, it would be an image of me or my truck, or both, caught on someone's doorbell camera. I'd been stupid and sloppy, I'd been desperate, and I hadn't gone into his house intent on killing him, but he was dead anyway, and I was responsible. So it was only a matter of time before the police were after me. Only a matter of time before Bethany and Lily knew I had killed a man. So there was only one thing to do, one possible way to redeem myself. There was nothing I could do to change the past. I couldn't bring George Reynolds back from the dead, but I could find the real killer and bring him to justice. If I did that, maybe my wife and daughter wouldn't just think of me as a murderer. If I had any hope of doing that, I couldn't be sloppy about it. I couldn't jump to conclusions like I had with Reynolds. I needed hard proof, beyond a reasonable doubt proof. So I thought about what a real detective would do. He would go to the crime scene, the first crime scene. That's where I headed. By the time I got there, it was dark. I could see that there was still a police car sitting on the place when I was a good way down the road. I hoped it wasn't the same guy I'd talked to the other day. 
I kept up my speed as I drove past, thinking about how I would get in there with the cops sitting there. About a hundred yards past the old gas station was a dirt road that led to a small neighborhood made up of single and double wide trailers. I took the turn and went into the neighborhood, taking an immediate right down another dirt road so I could get behind the gas station. Many of the trailers along the road were inhabited, but several weren't. I parked at one of the abandoned ones. It was windowless, slanted, and half burnt from some long ago fire. With my engine off, I pulled on a couple of the black nitro gloves and looked in the mirror. I still had my baseball cap on, pulled low. Then I looked out the windshield. A series of low hills dotted with clumps of trees separated the struggling neighborhood from the closed gas station. Thankful for the cover of darkness, I left my truck and walked toward the gas station. I stopped at a clump of trees where I could see the back of the structure and the squad car to the left of it. The cop car was facing away toward the road. I angled to the right, putting the building between myself and the cop, then started creeping toward it, staying low in the untrimmed wild grass. As I moved, I couldn't help but think why the police said they thought George Reynolds' murder was similar to the murders of the three girls. The public hadn't gotten any specifics on how the girls had been killed. No indication of whether they'd been shot or strangled or stabbed, nothing. But with my knowledge of Reynolds' murder, I had a clue. And I didn't think it likely that the murderers had shot all three girls and then dug the bullets out of them with a knife. So the only other thing that made sense was that each of the three girls had their hearts removed. I came to the back of the gas station and crept toward the rear door, stopping at the empty dumpster enclosure for a moment to listen for movement from the cop. There was only silence, aside from the sound of a single vehicle passing on the road. The rear door was locked tight, so I went along the back to the side opposite where the cop was sitting. The gas station had been abandoned for so long that most of the windows had been broken out by teenagers and subsequently boarded up but even the boards were looking shabby. I pressed on the board inside the rear window, but it only flexed slightly, not enough. I moved to the second one and pressed on it. The bottom of it moved easily, as though it were only secured at the top. Grabbing the bottom and the side, I pushed it harder, knowing that if it came off and fell to the floor, the cop would surely hear it. The wood creaked and cracked. I winced at the sounds, but kept pushing. Finally, the half-rotted plywood board broke and came off. I gripped it tightly and lowered it down inside the gas station, making as little noise as possible. It was easy to get inside after that, but there was no way to put the board back up securely. I managed to prop it up on the windowsill. It wouldn't stay if a stiff breeze came through, but it was better than nothing. I pulled out the burner phone I'd bought and activated the screen, casting pale blue light around I was standing near the back of the station, with the counter on my right and the hallway to the bathrooms on my left. The floor was dotted with trash, beer bottles, cigarette butts, and other junk. Someone, probably the police, had cleared a path through the trash from the front door to the hallway on my left. Picking my way toward the cleared path, I looked for anything that could be considered a clue. From the looks of it, the rest of the boards on the windows were intact. The two glass doors at the front were also boarded up. By the time I had covered the wide room that had served as the convenience store for the gas station, I was wondering just what the hell I thought I would accomplish by coming here. I didn't have the expertise, the equipment, or the infrastructure to be able to solve a crime like the police could. Did I think that I would stumble across a piece of paper that had the killer's name on it? Or maybe find an ID that he'd dropped? Would I find something that the police missed? The whole thing was ridiculous. Who did I think I was? Some Liam Neeson character? This was real life. And I'd killed a man because I had convinced myself he was responsible for the murders of three girls. But he wasn't. I had an overwhelming urge to just give up. To walk out to the police officer outside and turn myself in. My wife and daughter would never be able to look at me in the eyes again. But at least I wouldn't be making things any worse for myself. I knew that if I stopped right then, I could salvage some sort of self-respect. Maybe, after time passed, Bethany and Lily would come around. Maybe. 
but they sure wouldn't if I kept playing detective like some idiot who's watched too many movies. I would be caught eventually. There was no way around that. Why not just give it up now? As I turned to head back toward the window so I could go turn myself in, another voice spoke up in my head. Might as well check the rest of the place before you give up entirely, it said. You're already here. What would it hurt? I looked toward the hallway to the bathrooms. What's the point? I asked myself. Just finish the job, the other voice said. Look in the bathrooms, the office, you never know. I knew that voice didn't really think I would find anything. It was the voice of procrastination, the voice that feared being thrown into the thresher or the criminal justice system. But it got the better of me. Sighing, I walked down the hall and looked in the women's bathroom. Nothing of interest. Just two stalls, empty liquor bottles, and cigarette butts. It was the same thing in the men's room, except there was only one stall and one urinal. The last room before the rear exit was the office. I pushed the door open and shined the dim blue light from the phone inside. Jesus Christ! The words rushed out of me as I saw the state of the office. The room had been cleared of debris, and there was dried blood all over the floor. But the walls and ceiling were what drew my attention. They were covered in strange letters written in blood. As I looked closer, I recognized some of the letters. I saw A's, B's, H's, M's, and O's. But their order made no sense. And all the other letters looked like something you would see in a horror movie about cult rituals. Suddenly, I remembered the one podcast I'd listened to that talked about the possibility of a cult tie to the murders. At the time, I just thought the podcaster was making stuff up to get more listens. But this gave his theory some sort of credence. Maybe he really did have an inside line on someone in the police department. Maybe he wasn't full of shit. I raised the phone to take a picture, but stopped when I heard voices from the front of the gas station. It was two men talking. And then I heard the front doors open, and the voices grew louder. Shoving the phone in my pocket, I had to swallow a bout of panic. I turned to my left, looking at the rear door, even though I'd already seen the padlocked hasp securing it from the inside. Glancing down the hall toward the front of the store, I saw a flashlight beam growing near. Although they couldn't see me yet, they were getting closer. The men's restroom was the nearest room, so that's where I headed moving through the door just as the flashlight beam came down the hallway. I had to step carefully in the dark bathroom, trying to remember where all the liquor bottles were since I couldn't see them without the glow from my phone. The men's voices grew closer as I moved into the stall. I could hear them talking clearly now. It sounded as if they had stopped right across the hall at the office door. Who else knows about this? One of the men asked. There was something familiar about his voice, but I couldn't place it. Just me and Sergeant Ortiz and your people. No one else has been in here. This second voice I recognized immediately. It was the cop who'd been sitting at the gas station the other night when I stopped. The one who chased me off so quickly. Any of those podcasters been snooping around? The first man asked. Some of them have tried, the cop said. But I sent them all running with their tails between their legs. Okay, the feds have been making noise about moving in on this case, the first guy said. So we need to do something about this. Now, tonight, we can't wait any longer. There was a brief pause before the cop answered. Yes, sir. What were you thinking? You know how blood is. Even bleach wouldn't do the trick. So we burn it down. Yes, sir. Do you want me to handle it? No. I'm going to send one of my guys here to get the job done. When he's ready, you'll get an urgent call that you'll have to leave for. When you're on the call, he'll start the fire. Someone will call it in pretty quickly, I'm sure. But by the time the fire department puts it out, the office will be destroyed. Yes, sir. Then we'll have to do something about the other crime scenes. This is getting out of hand. If the feds get involved... He trailed off. Yes, sir. The cop answered after a moment. These goddamn heathens, the mystery man said. I heard the two of them turn and walk back down the hall, their voices fading as they talked about crime scene photos. Standing in the stall, I wondered just what the hell was going on. Why would the police be concerned that the feds would help on a serial killer case? And why would this officer be involved in arson? He's a dirty cop, I thought. Why wouldn't they want the feds to see the crime scene? 
I didn't have any answers, but the thought of turning myself in was out the window. If the cops were somehow involved in a cover-up, there was no way I could go to them. When I was sure the two men were out of the gas station, I used the glow of my burner phone to move out of the bathroom. Then I used the camera on the phone to take a bunch of pictures of the office. I thought I might need them. I hurried back to the board I'd left propped on the window, took it down, and climbed out. The cop car was still where it had been before, but I didn't see any other vehicles around. The other man was gone. Moving back across the field was difficult. I wanted to run as fast as I could, so I had to force myself to move slowly and stay low. By the time I reached my truck, I knew I had to get a look at the other crime scenes. Then, after I had pictures from all three of them, I would go to the feds and tell them what I knew. I would ask for a deal, for a short prison sentence for killing George Reynolds. Only when they agreed would I give them what I had. It was the best course of action, the only one. But as I backed out of the spot next to the abandoned trailer, I had to stop abruptly to keep from hitting a dark colored Jeep coming down the road. The Jeep passed slowly behind me. When it was clear, I pulled out and headed the same way the Jeep had come. And as I glanced in my rear view mirror, I saw the vehicle sitting in the middle of the dirt road next to one of the other abandoned trailers. It didn't have a license plate on the back. I wondered if it was the arsonist, parking there before he went down to burn the gas station. I didn't wait around to find out. After looking at the area around where the second murder took place, I understood why the murderer had chosen it. It was isolated, much more so than the gas station. The rundown trailer home sat on several acres of land, which backed up onto a green belt with well-maintained dirt trails. After driving by and seeing that there was only one police car sitting in the driveway 20 yards from the trailer, I knew which way I would go. On the other side of the green belt was a fairly new subdivision with several entrances to the trails. I parked in the neighborhood near one of the entrances and walked onto the green belt. Since it was after eight at night, the green belt was dark and mostly empty. There were no lights along the trails. I walked until I estimated I was opposite the trailer home and then ducked through the woods until I came to a barbed wire fence with a no trespassing sign on it. I made my way over the fence and crept through the woods until I could see the back of the mobile home. After watching for several minutes to see if the cop tasked with guarding the place would make a round on foot, I moved slowly toward the structure. When I reached it, I got in through the back door after breaking the crime scene seal. Once again, using my phone to light my way, I stepped into the decrepit structure. The floor creaked under my weight as I walked down the hallway, checking each room as I came to it. Parts of the floor were rotted out here and there, as were parts of the ceiling. The place hadn't been inhabited for many years, and the weather had taken its toll. While I had stepped carefully in the gas station for fear of kicking trash around, I stepped carefully in the trailer for fear of falling through the floor. It didn't take me long to find the empty bedroom where the murder had taken place. It was much like the office at the gas station. There were similar symbols drawn in blood all over the walls. Someone had taken tremendous care to write out these things that I couldn't fathom in an innocent girl's blood. The window in the bedroom was covered with foil on the inside, so I shut the door behind me and took about a dozen pictures of the room, using the flash to capture the bloody writings. When I was taking my last picture, I heard the creak of the hallway floor just outside the bedroom. Tensing, I turned and faced the door, sweat springing up all over my body. There was silence from the other side of the door, but someone was there. I could sense them. Their silence was deafening. Still holding the phone in my hand, I wondered if I could just stay silent and still long enough to get them to leave. It was a silly notion, but fear was messing with my mind. I sensed a quick shifting from the hallway a split second before the door burst open in a shower of rotting wood. A man dressed in black and wearing a mouthless balaclava mask rushed into the room a combat knife slashing out toward me as he came. I backpedaled and pressed the shutter button on my phone, taking a picture of the man. The bright flash momentarily blinded him, allowing me to get my left hand up to his wrist. I was just strong enough to keep him from slicing me open. We crashed into the wall and I dropped my phone to free my other hand. The man was strong. He tripped me and I went down, pulling him with me. We hit a weak part of the rotted bedroom floor and crashed through. 
I didn't realize what exactly was happening, only that I was falling and that I had to keep the knife away from me. When we came to rest underneath the trailer, I couldn't see anything. It was too dark and I had bits of rotted wood in my eyes, but I could feel the man's body as he struggled against me. I shoved him off and scrambled away, thinking he would come after me with the knife. But then I heard a wet cough and pained sounds coming from him. I stopped crawling away and rubbed my eyes, trying to get the grit out of them. The trailer didn't have a skirt around it, but the wild grass and shrubs had grown up all around, essentially blocking the view from the outside. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw that the knife had somehow ended up in the man's throat. His eyes were wide, their whites almost seeming to glow compared to the dark fabric of his balaclava. He gripped the knife as though on the verge of pulling it out of his throat, but he didn't dare. He knew it would only hasten his death. As it turned out, it didn't matter much. After coughing up more blood, he finally stilled. His eyes stayed open, but the lids relaxed slightly, giving him a drugged look. Hesitantly, I moved over toward him. I reached out and nudged the knife. He didn't move. He was dead. I stood up through the hole we'd created in the floor and found my phone. Then I ducked back down and crawled through the foliage at the back of the trailer. Then I hesitated. Turning back around, I crawled toward the dead man and took off his mask, which necessarily involved removing the knife from his throat first. I didn't recognize the man, but I took his picture just in case. Then I left, taking the knife with me. Since I no longer had my gun, it was the only thing I had to defend myself. Although I had no idea what the hell was going on, I was now in the middle of it, and I was a target because of it. I moved back to the green belt and toward my truck in the subdivision, knowing I had to go to the feds as soon as possible. But what I saw on the street near my truck made me realize that there was something else I had to do first, something much more important. The Jeep sat on the other side of the street about 20 yards down from my truck, the same Jeep I'd seen at the trailer park neighborhood. He had followed me, I realized as I hurried to my truck. The man who just attacked me was surely the man from the Jeep, and he'd seen my license plate. If he was connected to the cops, which I thought was a pretty good chance, then he knew who I was. He knew the address where my truck was registered. I fired up the engine and sped out of the neighborhood, heading straight for home. While I drove, I used my burner phone to call Bethany. It rang and rang. She didn't pick up. Of course, she wouldn't. She didn't know the number. So I left a message. Baby, it's me. Call me back at this number as soon as you can. Please, it's important. When I hung up, I texted her, saying that it was me and to call me. Green briar flew by outside my truck as I barreled toward my neighborhood. I kept the phone in one hand, waiting for her to call back. By the time I reached the house, she still hadn't called or texted. The house was quiet, but the lights were on as I hurried to the front door, keys in hand. I shoved the key into the deadbolt and moved to turn it, but it was already unlocked. A blade of fear pierced my stomach as I opened the door on the quiet house. Bethany? I called. No answer. Lily? Nothing. I had left the combat knife in the truck, so I rushed quickly to the kitchen and grabbed the knife out of the block on the counter. Then I moved down the hallway toward the bedrooms. Lily's was first. I looked inside and fought the urge to vomit when I saw the mess that her room was. There had been a fight. The knickknacks from her desk were scattered all over the floor. Her sheets and blanket were off the bed in a twisted pile, and her phone was lying on the floor. I rushed to my bedroom and froze when I saw the blood all over the floor. There were strings of drying blood between the bed and the bathroom. There was no sign of Bethany or Lily. I snagged my phone from where I'd left it on my desk and called Bethany once more. This time, the call was picked up on the second ring, but it wasn't my wife's voice that came through. It was a man's voice, a familiar voice. Carter Elrod, he said. I assume you're at home by now. Where's my wife and daughter? My voice came out as a squeak. I knew this guy had the upper hand and I knew I would do whatever it took to get my family back. What have you seen? The man asked. I thought about lying, but knew it was a bad idea. Two of the crime scenes, the writings on the walls and ceiling. You took pictures? Yes. And have you shown them to anyone else? Don't lie to me now. 
If you lie, your family dies. No, I haven't shown them to anyone. And do you know what they mean? I paused at that. Why would I know what they mean? No, I said. I have no idea. Okay, Mr. Elrod. I'm sure you know what comes next. I'm going to give you an address. You're going to show up alone. And we'll trade what you have for what I have. Do you agree? Yes, I said. Of course. Then I remembered the blood on the bedroom floor. Let me hear their voices. They're alive, he said. But if you don't do as you're told, they will die horribly. Do you get me? Yes, just let me hear their voices. I need to know. Are you ready for the address? Without waiting for an answer, he rattled off an address. I grabbed a pen and wrote the address down. You have 20 minutes, the man said, then hung up. I looked up the address and saw that it was an abandoned grain elevator not far from outside of town. It was a 20 minute drive. Thinking only of Bethany and Lily, I ran out of the house, not even bothering to close the door, and got into my truck. Once I saw where the grain elevator was on the map, I knew I could get to it by memory. So I sped out of the neighborhood in much the same way I had sped into it minutes earlier. But, as often happened when I drove anywhere, I got to thinking as I drove. The man's voice was so familiar, I was sure it was the same man I'd heard at the gas station, the one who was apparently in charge. But even when I'd heard his voice at the gas station, I knew I'd heard it before. I just couldn't place it. Then there was the question he asked me about whether I knew what the writing on the walls meant. It didn't make sense to me. If it was some ancient cult language or symbolism, how would I know? What if it's not some ancient language, I thought. What if it's a language in use today? I remembered reading an article about how you could take a picture of writing in a foreign language and have an app translate it for you. Driving with one hand, I pulled out the burner phone and searched the preloaded apps, finding Google Translate and opening it up. From there, it was a simple matter of giving the app access to the photo library and selecting the photo I wanted it to translate. I picked one of the pictures from the first crime scene at random. The app worked for a few moments and then overlaid the strange words with English words. I nearly ran a red light while reading the translation, my jaw dropping open. After I stopped at the light, I had the app translate another picture from the gas station office. I read that, realizing that the police had possessed the power to stop the murders the whole time, but they let those girls die. By the time I had read the writing from the pictures of the second crime scene, I was getting close to the grain elevator. With the new information I'd gleaned from the translations, which were Cyrillic, according to the app, I also knew who the voice belonged to. It was the state police superintendent, Jeffers, the man who'd held the press conferences after each murder. Superintendent Jeffers was holding my wife and daughter hostage. He'd let three innocent girls get murdered, if the Russian writing on the crime scene walls was true. And given what I'd heard at the abandoned gas station, I thought it was true. But the knowledge didn't help me, not in any meaningful way. I still had to get my wife and daughter back somehow, but I'd seen enough movies to know that he would probably kill us all once he had what he wanted. So I had to make sure he didn't get it until my wife and daughter were free and clear. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.